Would you like to discover powerful ways to drive change in your organization? Would you like to learn about the latest concepts in people strategy, HR effectiveness, and optimization that will help your organization achieve a competitive advantage in your industry? Then HRBP MBA Masterclass with Ron Thomas is for you. With today's uncertain business landscape, HR leaders now play a pivotal role in what some say is a paradigm shift in the industry. This comprehensive three-day program, in-person or virtual, will empower you to embrace a more strategic mindset, enhance your decision-making skills, and help your organization to the next level. To register as a group or individual, email us at info at strategyfocusgroup.com or visit our website at www.strategyfocusgroup.com. Good morning, good evening. Depending upon what part of the world you're in, if it's Friday, it is the CEO series where we bring together global leaders, entrepreneurs, innovators, and disruptors. We're pleased to have as our guest today, my dear friend, Raju Manhayan. Manhian. Hello, Ron. Manhian. Hello, Ron Thomas. Manhian. That's How okay. Are How are you? He's an author, coach, facilitator, President Emeritus of IAF Philippines. He's the author of five books on communication and leadership. He's certified as a neuro-linguistic programming, mind mapping, appreciative inquiry, and it goes on and on. It would take me a while to read his full bio. He spent two years as, as an engineer, two years as a financial consultant, and 20 years as CEO of an international mercantile firm working across Mediterranean, Mediterranean Europe, Latin America, and North America. Welcome. Glad to have you here with us today. My pleasure, Mr. Thomas, to be in your room with you. <laughs> so, you know, let's start with the books. You know, when I was looking through your, your literature and been knowing you for, for a long, long time, five books that you've published, five books under your belt. Some people are still struggling with one, like myself. Which one gave you the most pleasure in, in, in getting those thoughts on paper? Of the five, I would be cheating on the other four. I think each one of them was fun. Okay. Uh, but if you want to pick one, there's a book called Pitbulls and Entrepreneurs. Oh. And uh, I had the most fun writing it because it was born out of a conversation, just one single presentation to a bunch of graduating university students and they they said tell us how to be an entrepreneur mm. and just about that time i was well i'm into dogs and that just about that time i was into pit bulls and i said you know entrepreneurs like need to be like pit bulls they never need to give up and so that is the most fun book the most easy read book and it's also the most profound because you know, uh, I wasn't holding back any punches. Okay. You know, like you just give it all. Like yeah. if you feel like writing something, put it in because you know, my father, my forefathers, my uncles, everyone around me was an entrepreneur, and right? to a large extent, so am I. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what is in the book. Tenacity, not giving up. Yeah, tenacity is the word. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you were facing all these things. So how do you give give us some insight as to because lots of people in careers that are that are at a crossroads, a lot of people that are entrepreneurs are struggling. So it's easy yeah. to say tenacity and we do these kinds of things. But how do you self-motivate or give us some tidbits on that? Right. Right. Great. Uh, let's say. You're going to run a race and it has a start and it has a finish, right? A race has a start and a finish. And so does uh, getting into business and succeeding in a business. So one of my friends and mentors, Jim Katkat, he says to get started, 
just wear your shoes and step out. Mm. Just to get started, put on your shoes and step out. And then not stop until you succeed comes from another wise old man, my son. He says, you know, it's the last hour, it's the last minute when you feel like giving up. Yeah. That's the time to go on. Yeah. So two things, getting started. Yeah. And when you feel like giving up, not stopping. Mm. That reminds me of a quote that Martin Luther King talked about is that you take a step when you don't even see the stairs and basically you just continue on. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's tough because you see so many people. I teach a course at American University in Dubai and you you have a lot of kids, uh, young people in the class who yeah. are getting MBA degrees and, yeah. and you know, and my thought always is that everybody has an idea. You stop yeah. the person on the street, they got an idea, but it's execution that's going to make it happen. Right, right, right. Uh, beyond just a single idea, I think, uh, especially when you're in college and coming out of college, um, in my days, I used to smoke. So did people around me. I think half the world smoked. Yeah. And we used to joke, we used to kid to my classmates that after every smoke, I have a brand new business idea. So in a single day, in a single day, I think people come up with scores and hundreds of ideas. Mm -hmm. It's taking that one idea and just running with it, you know. Mm -hmm. That's that's the power behind uh, making an idea come true. Yeah, yeah. Because everybody, you know, one of the other things that I think about a lot, you know, because you talk to people, everybody wants to be the entrepreneur, but they're looking at, I think they're vi they're looking at a vision of, the successful entrepreneur and they're and they're baking it on that model yeah, and not yeah, yeah. realizing that all the things you have to go to to even get to that stage yeah. and that's what you need so my thought is do they need to prepare for that or should they just keep that light on that finish line the race uh, oh i want to i want to tell you a quick story it just came into my mind and i was just thinking about how did i get for how did i first get started and how did I succeed? Well, out of college, ideas, lots of ideas, but no action. And then a couple of actions and then failure. One day in New York, in your neighborhood, next to New Jersey, Sunday afternoon, Sunday morning, late brunch time, I was sitting and watching TV. And those days, you know, there was no internet, but you could watch all kinds of shows on yeah. New York TV. And I think there was a guy an African-American guy, maybe he was Uncle Sam's cookies or Mel's cookies. He was successful in the cookie business. Mm. And Ron, I was sitting there, you know, Sunday morning and I'm like in my shorts and T-shirts and sipping tea. This guy comes on and he goes, are you in your room sitting down there and wanting to do business? And I go, yeah. And he said, are you there sipping tea and biting into your biscuits and just dreaming about success? And I go, yeah, this guy is really cool. He knows what I'm doing exactly. And he says, are you wearing those, you know, cheap shorts and cheap t-shirts and hoping to become a millionaire? And I go, yeah, this guy is looking at me. <laughs> and he said, he said, at the end of it, he goes, you can spend a lifetime studying to succeed. You won't succeed unless you step out and do it, you know. You will get, gather all the data, the information, put all everything in place and still not do it unless you want to really do it. So step out of the shorts, put the cup of tea and coffee down and just go, you know. Yeah. Uh, the meaning of the word, sorry to interrupt, the meaning of the word entrepreneurship, it means to enter and take charge entrepreneurship and from where i come from and my mother raised me and she used to say these words she used to say ranchu if you want to succeed in school if you want to succeed at anything you got to have enter internal mm. prerna prerna is like not just an aspiration but a gut-driven aspiration, like you don't give up. So Perna is 
persistence. You know, you got to have internal persistence. So if you look at the words, if you look at the etymology of the words entrepreneurship, enter and take charge, entrepreneur, that means internal persistence and aspiration, a combination. That is business. That is su succeeding in business. Yeah. So, you know, in, in, in your background, you were a CEO for, for multiple years, numerous years as a CEO. And when you look at a CEO doing that period and you look at a CEO doing the period we're in now, what do you see as major, major differentiating points? Uh, well, there's, there's a slight difference uh, between a CEO who builds his own business okay. and a CEO who is placed on top of a ready-made structure. Mm -hmm. There's an essential difference, I will tell you. Someone who's built the business up from ground yeah. and someone who is nicely planted on top of it. Yeah. Uh, not that either of them can do a bad job. Some of them can do a really good job. Well-trained CEOs who have worked their way up on the corporate ladder sometimes do a great job. But I think uh, what is important there is, number one, tenacity is key. And to understand the depth and breadth of what their business is all about and how is it that they're serving their customer? Mm -hmm. What are the things that they will do that will bring pleasure and fulfillment to their customer? That's extremely important. Mm. So those that understand that part, I think, bring the business forward. You know, they impact the profit and loss and they impact the people and they have an impact on society. Yeah. The technical side as well as the soft side. And absolutely. Doing... Absolutely. So yeah. there's a, a good friend of mine who's the CEO of Fine Holdings in, in, in uh, Dubai, and he's the most inspirational guy. But he started out as, as a physical education teacher. Wow. Who's this? Yeah. At Fine Holdings in uh, in Dubai, his name is James Lafferty, and he's the most amazing guy. We were just in Pakistan a while ago because we were both giving speeches. But his, when you talk about how do you how do you rise from a physical ed teacher to not being a CEO, and he started working in a company, um, Procter and Gamble, and he was the fitness person for the executives, and they saw something and they brought him in, and it's just an amazing story. And yeah. every time he gives a speech, people will always gravitate towards that because no big MBA, no top school, no nothing, physical ed degree from a from yeah, a yeah, university. Yeah. Other education, yeah. on it, but for the most part. I know, big, I know big Jim Lafferty personally. Big Jim Lafferty, you know, bigger than both of us put together. Yes. And uh, uh, he was on my show more than a decade ago. Okay. Uh, when he was with PNG, and after PNG, he moved to Philip Morris. And from yes. Philip Morris, I think, he's now moved to the Middle East. And he, he shared his story. He said, Raju, I was a PE coach. You know, yeah. I was like a health coach for PNG. That's right. And then they put me on top of it. And I, I think. Um, Jim, big Jim, big Jim, uh, I think he earned his stripes in Nigeria. Yeah. He earned his stripes in Nigeria and through hard knocks, yeah. it struck him and he worked with small businessmen in, in and around Nigeria and Lagos. Yeah. And that's where he picked up on how first yeah. to understand what creates money for the business and how to manage people, mm. you know? So that's that. I mean, so his school of hard knocks was Lagos, Nigeria. Yeah. And he's he shared some very tough stories. So people can learn anywhere. My school was the streets of New York. I must tell you, uh, Ron, I didn't understand business. All the books I read, all the schools I went to didn't help me until I began to beat the streets of New York with my friends there. And after that, today, anyone talks business and i know where they're getting at where they're coming from and where they're going to yeah the business mindset it comes in and and, and, yeah. then, and lots of times in schools you know you're not going to pick up in a lot of cases the what you learn from hard knocks and yeah, try to yeah. navigate and do all these yeah. kinds of things. It, it, it's it's that moment it's it's not a quick aha by the way yeah 
it, it's not like, aha, uh -huh, I got it. No, it's a lot of blood and sweat. Yeah. And post the blood and sweat, suddenly your muscles begin to flex. Yeah. Suddenly you have the muscles to run, start, run, and grow a business. Mm. So who do you look for inspiration? I mean, you've, uh, you, you're at the top of the food chain. So let's go ahead and accept that. You're at the top of the food chain in the, in the, in the area you are, you're in. What is your well, uh, I, I think I take inspiration from everyone. Okay. Lots of people, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. Okay. Right there, in a, you're not in Dubai today. You'll be in Dubai tomorrow. Yeah. In Dubai, I have a friend, and uh, his name is Niranjan Gidwani. Okay. And I think he used to head Samsung for the longest time. Right now, he's a consultant and retired. Gem of a human being. My former college mate, he was. We went to college together. Okay. And absolutely ethical understands business and for the last 40 years he was a big guy in all of middle east you know and uh, his sense of ethics his sense of integrity his sense of understanding what it is to be human and to run a business yeah that's the first one you now so i take inspiration from niranjan i take inspiration inspiration from my two sons one of them just started up a company called metaverse go and he's putting together cryptocurrency and gaming and stuff. And it's mind blowing what he's doing here in the Philippines. And he actually travels back and forth from the Middle East. That's one guy, my eldest. And my second son is a community development coach for Facebook out of Menlo Park. Okay. Oh, Menlo Park. And, uh, right, right. And he gives me the big picture on where and how the world is moving. So he tells me, Pa, this is what is right nowadays. This is how the trends are coming. So I get all the information I want from just a few people, but it's not from one person, by the way. Okay, okay. So, I, so I'm taking away from that as reflection because you're reflecting and they're giving you insights in their world. And that's, yeah. kind, of, that's kind of the grounding that keeps you grounded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think the important thing that I do or the thing that maybe someone can learn from is that I listen to these people with an open heart and a mind. I, I mean, I give it, I don't say, no, that's not right. You know, I know better. I learned something back in the eighties or nineties. No, uh, the world changes every single second. You know that yeah. in a flash of a second, it's a brand new world. So uh, you need to keep your ear to the ground. And, and my ear to the ground is these people. Yeah, that's uh I read an article, they were talking about the post-COVID experience and they said for organizations, they need to listen more. And I always yeah. I always come back to that. We all need to listen more, not listen yeah. before, so we can put our interpretation on, but just listen yeah. Yeah. to what yeah. people are talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's correct. Listen more, observe more, mm -hmm. you know, give your listening and observation a lot of reflection, right? And then go step into the cold waters, you know, uh, test the waters every now and then, you know, and you will find out, you know, do what we spoke about in the beginning, put the, put on your shoes and get off. Take that and step. Then don't, don't, don't finish the race until it's finished and don't stop the race until it's finished. Mm. So if, as you've kind of morphed into like your well global executive coach, and you're dealing with a lot of the so-called big shots across the globe. Yeah. Any major themes you're picking up of struggles that collectively, yeah, that those leaders are struggling with from that level? Uh, uh, sorry, your friend sent me a message on the side, no? What's his name? Uh, ask me that question again. What am I picking up? No, I'm saying no. that as yeah. you as you're a global coach and you deal with leaders across the globe, yeah, is, is yeah. there a theme that's coming through that, that you're yeah. kind of picking up that leaders are struggling with today? Yeah. Because I, the reason I ask that is because when you look at the tech sector, the past couple of weeks, it's just been decimated from Facebook yeah. to Google to Twi well, Twitter is a totally different example, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Major uh, theme. Go ahead. 
So I, I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm really, really fortunate. The kind of work I do and the kind of people I get to converse with. And uh, it's like getting a brand new book. Every time you come up with an eminent CEO or head of a company or a senior manager, and I, I get to meet them every day, mm. every day. And uh, my feeling is, of course, some of them, a lot of them are treading new ground. Yeah. Even most of us don't really know what will happen next week. Facebook laid off 11,000 people yesterday. Yeah. You know? And uh, well, one of my family members was laid off too, not my son. Yeah. And uh, the others who are not in the tech sector, most of them have, have no absolute idea like what, how far can I plan? Yeah. Because I think the world is just forming, it's just coming together. And you and I spoke a few months ago. In yeah. my opinion, the world has flipped. You know, when the world flipped, the soil, the atmosphere, the ambience, all is changing shape. Uh, the smart ones are moving with a little faith and humility because they know they can be hit in the face one more time. Yeah. And they're moving forward with faith and humility. And I think that's the trend. That's what uh, leaders need to do. Move forward, expect failure, but have faith in what has been uh, the cause of their success in their past mm -hmm. and be humble to the fact that maybe they don't know everything. Maybe they can still be wrong tomorrow. Yeah. But plug on gently and bring your people along. Bring a large number of people along because machines are, won't help you. People will. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, so one of the things that I, that I speak about a lot, te technological solutions for doing things, yeah, but the humility side, the people side, the soft side of yeah. uh, under the so-called underbelly of an organization. Yeah, and I think a new level of leader because I think the pendulum has swung. It swung in the employees' favor, yeah. whether you want to agree with it or not. Because you, if you impose strict guidelines on me, I can take my talent and go to the highest bidder. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, let's not deny technology. Let's not deny the power that technology gives us, you know, because sometimes we get so obsessed with it. Yeah. Uh, we forget the human side of it. What go. I'm saying, keeping the human side in mind, go ahead and then conquer the world. We're using technology as much as possible because that's what the world is all about. A decade from now, I feel that the way we see things, these little meetings that we hold with Zoom and non-Zoom, they're going to change. They're actually evolving. So in a matter of months, I think we'll be talking to each other in a different format through a different medium. So we need to be ready and open for that very, very quickly. Mm. So what's the most important risk you took and why did you take it? All right. So uh, the biggest risk I took was being a business person, being the head of a business organization. I decided to give it up all, and I decided to ch I decided to change, ch chase my passion, which is this, okay. which is to learn, to grow, and then to share the learning and the growing, and that's what I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's my mission. I call it, you know, change the world one leader at a time. Yeah. Give that one leader more clarity, more creativity, and more conscientiousness. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Clarity, creativity, and conscientiousness. That's what I do. One person at a time, or maybe a hundred people at a time. Around. Okay. Purpose, purpose driven. Purpose driven. That's, yeah. That's that's guiding you. Um, yeah. What do you see as the most dangerous trait for leaders that you see? leaders headed towards a, 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 a certain direction and let's come back let's calm down and let's rethink this what do you see was, as was the most dangerous trait yeah and uh of all the leaders that i meet there are some who are very popular in their own minds very famous in their own minds 
and uh, they begin to deceive themselves if success comes their way. Yeah. Sometimes it comes through the numbers they push around. Sometimes it comes by chance, yeah. per chance. You know, you're just there, right? You're a manager and something shifted around and suddenly you were made CEO. And they think it was because of their own efforts. Okay. They forget the fact that there was a certain amount of chance. Yeah. You know? And then it stays in their head and they refuse to listen. Mm -hmm. Just what you said. They refuse to listen. They refuse to flex. Yeah. And no matter how much you work with them in their head, like, hey, I've done it. So I don't know. Uh, I think Marshall Goldsmith calls it a certain kind of a fallacy. Yeah. It's a certain fallacy. So it's in their own head. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most dangerous trait. And yeah. I work with certain leaders like that. I'm sorry. I wasn't able to impact some of them. Yeah. You, you yeah. know what I'm saying? I understand exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so if you if you were to Google if people that are on the call, leadership blind spots, and you read through that and you said, yep, yep, uh huh, okay, this one here, and it, it goes through because every every one of those directives you can match someone to that that you've dealt with, and you're at yeah. a you're at a much higher level as an executive coach than I am, but I deal with a lot of CEOs and their teams, and I see so many of these. But in their mind, they yeah. are top shelf. I mean, they're yeah. nailing it. Yeah, they're the king of the heap. <laughs> uh, Self-deception, the word for that is self-deception. Yeah. By the way, Ron, I, I am not a much more higher level than you as an executive coach. I am just like anyone else. Most other coaches across the world we are absolutely the same. Uh, the young ones, the old ones, the experienced one, the inexperienced one, we are all the same. I get to talk to a lot of coaches, you know, when yeah. I practice coaching, yeah. every other day, I mean, some of them are fabulous. Mm -hmm. And everyone that takes a leap into coaching, true coaching, I think uh, there is a certain brightness, a certain brilliance in, in their hearts and minds. And that's why they take a leap into it. And those that have that brightness and that brilliance, they stay with it and yeah. they succeed with it very easily. Yeah. So all of them, we are all the same. Uh, one of my favorite coaches in the world is a lady called uh, Janet Harvey. She just released a book called Invite Change. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I urge you to invite her. She's amazing. Okay. And she's really brilliant. She's to me, she's like, the Drucker and the Dalai Lama in one. Wow. You should ask her that question. Hey, Janet, what's coming around the corner? What's happening tomorrow? She'll tell you. Yeah. And she might be really, really right. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I, 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 will, <laughs> I will follow up with her, um, you know, because I'd, I'd love to have interesting people on and different takes, you know, because we're, we all basically do the same things inside of organizations, trying to right the ship or whatever it is. And yeah. Here's something that bothers me from from our side, is that everybody brands themselves today as coach. Yep. And I think my interpretation, the word has been cheapened because everybody and their mother's a coach. When you look online, coach, 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 innovator, evangelist, all these things. I'm like, so how did you get there? What have you? What insights? Can you give me your interpretation of that? Because maybe it's just me. <laughs> Asia's best, right? Number one. Number one in the world, Asia's best. Most everyone is Asia's best, the world's best, or the number 10th or the number 20th. Yeah. Uh, I don't think uh, I want to measure people by the standards, they, by the little titles they put under their names. No? Yeah. It's yeah. how they treat me. It's how they interact. Okay. And how your word spreads sometimes you know i'm lucky i consider myself lucky and fortunate i get calls from ends of the world which i've never reached never touched and they say hey raju we heard of what you did for such and such person can you help us out here in fact just today i got two of those calls not that i succeed but i, I think that's a blessing and you can only get that blessing if you stay on track if yeah. you keep doing the right thing yeah, it's uh, I, I see my friend Charlotte, who's the head of CIPD in uh, Middle yeah. East. She says, I agree with this, Ron. It's so difficult sifting through 
there's so many coaches. And so, I, and I, so yeah. Charlotte, thank you for that because I'm not the only one that's feeling that, you know, and, and, but so how do we stand out because of the body of our work um, to realize that we have the pedigree and we've been doing yeah. it for a while versus someone yeah. who's, I saw a gentleman, you know, who's, who's mid twenties and he's an expert, 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 everything. He's an expert. And I'm like, wow, it must be great to be an expert in your mid twenties. <laughs> you know, when, yeah. <laughs> I, I think, I think uh, the way you stand out is, to not make an effort to stand out. Yeah. Not make an effort to just stand out and be seen, but to make an effort to do the right thing consistently. Okay. Again and again, through okay. hard times, through tough times, you know, to okay. go on and repeat the process, you know, to to uh, work your craft. Okay. You know, to work your passion slowly. And I think, uh, I mean, you guys in America say, you build and they will come. So you keep on building it slowly. Yeah. And then they will come. Yeah. So I have doubts about that phrase, but we'll talk that offline. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Yeah, we'll do it offline. Uh, so, so let's take a commercial break, and then we'll come right back. Yeah, all right. Okay, cool. Do I look blurry on the... Identify and book the world's best speakers for your next event. Mina Speakers is the leading speakers and MC bureau in the Middle East. We bring global talent to the region and have established the region as a key global hub for speakers. Inspire and motivate your audience. Find exactly what you are looking for by working closely with us to assist you in understanding the cost-benefit analysis tied to selecting a speaker for any event. Ensure that your audience is educated, engaged and empowered. Connect with us for a quick response and tailored advice. Book your speakers now. Okay, cool. We, we just got some feedback from Charlotte. She asked a question for us both from the other side. What, what questions would you ask a potential coach in order to determine their level? Amazing, what, amazing. Wow, wow. Coach? You, you take your shot first. Well, uh, she, she asked both of us, so you're the host. Why don't you take the shot first? Well, I was going to push it off to you to see where you was going to come in, but I'll take it. So my thought would, would talk, talk to me about success stories that you've had. Give me examples of coaching situations you've gone in and maybe the leader was totally blinded and how you were able to walk them through that process. Walk me through the journey. Where are they now? And that yeah. would be my interpretation of that and to kind of filter through to uh, through that and then i would follow up based on what they told me so that one question could come back with three or four questions following up from that yeah well so okay right so that's your uh that's your strategy mine would be if i wanted someone to coach me you know uh at first check how i feel in his or her presence I, I, I check my own visceral feelings around that person, you know? Yeah. Uh, do I feel uneasy? Do I feel safe? Do I feel that I can trust this person? And uh, how is this person regarding me? Is he regarding me as an object, as a customer, or as just another notch on his gun? Mm -hmm. Is he, oh, I got another client, no? So I think uh, I've checked that aspect within myself. How do I feel in the presence of this coach to be for me? Okay. And uh, then I probably, if I feel comfortable, if I feel I'm safe, then probably I check upon his or her process. Like, how do you go about helping me get clarity? Okay. How do you go about uh, helping me achieve the outcomes I desire? Okay. So, and then the explanation, if his method s aligns with his persona and it assures me, I think those two steps would be okay for me. Okay. Cool. So one is, how do I feel with Ron? And then I check with Ron, Ron, how do you go about doing this? How do you go about helping me out? Yeah. And Ron explains, and it's, the explanation is simple enough, 
easy to understand, I'd probably sign him up. I hope Charlotte, that's good for you. Okay, cool. Hey, Raj, can you can you your 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 face is very blurred. Yeah, I know. I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's my camera. Maybe it's midnight. But maybe it's <laughs> it's it's the light in my eyes. Okay. This what is it. Okay. So one other way of looking at that, Charlotte, and and and, and this is what Raju was talking about, is that before I engage with someone, I just want to sit and have a cup of coffee. And I call it a chemistry meeting. And I'll say, can we do a chemistry Yeah, uh, that's the word for it. That's a term for it. So I just open it up. Yeah. How do I feel in your presence? And how do I, how do you? Okay, Raj is, Raju has blanked out for a second there. Um, so Charlotte, that was a good question, you know, that you asked, because as I said, so many people are, are confused. Um, when everybody just tags themselves as that. So how do you differentiate between that? So my first step would be a chemistry meeting. And as, as Raju was talking about, just to get a sense of how comfortable you feel just in having a conversation. And it may not be about just the situation that we're dealing with. So if this is a one hour session that we're having, uh, 50 minutes so that could be just getting to know each other. What are the struggles you're challenged with? What is how is work? All these kinds of things, and then we can kind of segue into that. So, so Coach Raju is back with us. Glad you're back. Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. Cool. Cool. So let's switch the conversation to em employees. So when you look at um, when you look at what's going on in organizations, that, you know, with, with Twitter, and you look at all these kinds of things, uh, Facebook, Google, all the tech sector that are li that's laying off people. How do you? What advice would you give to people that are in this flux and they don't know what to do next? They possibly know that they don't want to continue to do this and they want to do something else and they're kind of on the treadmill and they're trying to figure it out. What advice would you give someone in that shape, which is a lot of people are today? I, I actually haven't thought of an answer, Ron. Uh, I just heard about it and it's, it's, it's a little painful. I read some of the stories on LinkedIn of former Facebook employees who are going to be laid off. And my son who didn't get laid off, by the way, was a bit concerned and yeah. So uh, at the end of it, when he said, hey, Pop, some of my friends got laid off. And my word to them was reality. My words to him were reality, yeah. impermanence of life, mm. and just hang on. Life will change around the corner one more time. No? Yeah. But uh, that, that's philosophical. Like, you know, just yeah. hang on. Yeah. You said that many times. But uh, the truth is that the pandemic, the last two or three years, yeah. flip the world, and some of the after effects are still being felt by us. So inflation, economies, lack of this, you know, raise, uh, rising prices. Some industries have, of course, grown very, very much successfully. Others have not. And I think the same is happening with individuals. Mm -hmm. So it's just a flip around. And in time, if certain businesses shut down, there will be others that come up. The yeah. talent is required. The world needs change. The world needs a lot of good. It's just that 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 avenue, those avenues that were the way to change the world are just becoming a bit narrow for a while. Yeah. So the amount of time uh, the pandemic took two or three years, maybe it's the same amount of time or maybe more it will take for the world to just come about and normalize. You know? Yeah. So... Uh, well, most of the people who have been laid off are mostly the young ones. Yeah. And uh, the senior ones got laid off 15 years ago during the 2008 crisis. I met many of them. Yeah. And But they've survived. You know, some went into driving cars, cabs, Uber and stuff, but they're here. They're still around. Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because there was a, I used to do a lot of work in Singapore. And a gentleman who was a pilot for one of the airlines always enjoy cooking and you know how in the asian countries they have the stalls and he and his wife started a business cooking i forget now what dish he was making but he'd been making it all this time and it just took off and he became very very successful it's still very successful 
And when it came time for him to go back to what his thought his love was flying, he says, I enjoy doing this more so than going through, through and going all through the minutiae of, of being an employee again. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so my thought is, it's just a blip on the screen. If you're in your 20s or 30s and you get a bump here, 30 years from now, you may look back and it was the best thing that could have ever happened. Because sometimes we, and I know it's easy to say, but people are struggling with financial reasons and all this, but sometimes we need a bump to make well, us kind of come out of the stupor. So I say for the global environment, COVID was that. We all needed a bump. Every organization needed a bump, and they had it, and now they're trying to yeah, come yeah. back. A lot of them are coming yeah. back. That's my interpretation. Yeah. It, it was a big bump. Yeah. In fact, it was more than just a blip. It was a couple of blips. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, but then again, you know, uh, again, things will uh, flourish one more time. Yeah. You know, that that's the cycle of life. That's impermanence. We call it a niche curve from where I come from. You know, sure. the uncertainty of everything. Yeah. But things improve, and uh, it happened in '97. It happened in 2008 in a minor way, and again in 2020. 2020 was a much bigger hit, but yet I think things will improve. Newer things will rise out of this. Newer trends and technologies will rise rise out of this. So Uber didn't exist back in '97. Neither did Facebook. Right? <laughs> yeah. And look, look what is done to the world. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, well. Take That's a holiday, guys. You know, uh, take a holiday. Go ahead and indulge in what you want to indulge. In the thick of the COVID, in the first six months or a year, I planted 3,000 trees single-handedly. I, I, I had saw. nothing to do. I was just picking up and planting trees, you know. Well, 600 of them are still living. The others died. Okay. Okay, cool. So you made you made your mark on society. So yeah. Charlotte just put in another uh, question here, which is a good question. Do you think everyone is coachable? She says, do you think that everyone is coachable? So we have these meetings and you realize that nope. Yeah, that's what you think? No. Nope. I, I no, think... I, uh, let me give you my interpretation of that. I've had sure. meetings, chemistry meetings and I yeah. just not feel, I, I, I just wasn't feeling it. You know, the connection yeah. wasn't there. Yeah. And I said, you know what? I said, it's not my area of expertise, so maybe I can refer you to someone. I just wanted to get away from it because it wasn't there. I yeah. wasn't you took the words out of my mouth. Everyone is coachable, Yeah. not by you. Not by me. Okay. Not by you alone. Okay. But they can be coachable by someone else because, again, let's go back to chemistry. Let's go back to the fact, does everyone feel comfortable in your presence? And that's not true. Yeah. So if you can't coach someone, there will be someone who will coach that person. And of course, the coachy client needs to get into that mindset that I need to change. There's something about me that needs to change. And this lady, Charlotte, can help me. You know? okay. Raju cannot, Ron cannot, but Charlotte can. Okay. So uh, time will come. It may not be tomorrow morning. It might be next week. But yet people do change people do get clarity in time you know people do move forward okay cool so as we close out i want to ask you one question what's the most important leadership lesson you've learned over your career good one uh in in the most simple words very common uh walk your talk okay simple i uh, i don't want to say anything mighty ron but walk your talk because I've realized in my lifetime that many times I've tried to put across points. I've tried to put across paradigms and then people around me don't change. But yeah. if I change my own behavior, if I change my own demeanor, people watch me. Mm -hmm. People look at me closely yeah. and then they see the sense and wisdom of adapting to what I'm doing. Yeah. My words alone don't help. Mm -hmm. My actions do. Yeah. I, I I got one story to, to tag on to that. I, when I first went into business in Dubai, I met a, cl a potential client, and was going. He was going on and on and on about what a great leader he was. I mean, just going on and on and on. He talked a good, very good game. Yeah. But his HR person was sitting there, and she wouldn't even make eye contact with me. So I knew there was something going on. And as the meeting ended, and she walked me out to my car she told me about he talks a good game 
but he doesn't live that. He comes in every morning. He doesn't even say good morning. Ouch. Yeah, and, but he talks about how engaged his employees are, all these kinds of things. And I always go back to that because the blind spots were there. But he's, in his mind, he is the greatest leadership executive on the planet. And it was mm -hmm. disconnecting. I almost felt sorry for him, you know, as a result of that. So that kind of segue into what you were talking about. I, uh, yeah. If I were you, if I were that HR person, I would forgive that human being. Yeah. She because left. They, no, she left. No, but uh, because the guy who talks about himself being a great leader actually doesn't know what he's doing wrong. Yeah. So you're right. There would uh, our sympathy and empathy. You know, those people who think that they are the biggest shots on earth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so. Thank you for making time for us. I know it's late on your side of the world. You're in the Philippines. What time is it there now? It's it's ten forty five. Ten forty five. Ten forty five. I'm sorry, you know, I, I have a little eye trouble and light trouble in this new apartment I've come in. So I still have to get my studios fixed. Yeah, no worries. Until next time. Until until next time. Thank you so much, man. And I'll Adios see you, and I'll, I'll Mumbai. See, I see you in February. If you're in February in Mumbai. Right on. Oh, okay. Bye. Cool. Okay. Bye-bye.